Being stuck in Antarctica for months with no outside contact was atrocious. But in hindsight, considering what we discovered happened in the outside world, it was an absolute blessing. May was the last time that we had a resupply ship or contact from the mainland. It is now October. All of our attempts at contact have ended in failure. The remaining researchers at this remote Antarctic outpost have instituted a rationing program to save the fresh water, food, and these supplies that we have left. We had enough supplies to keep the station running for half a year without resupply, but we were getting pretty close to running out. There were issues with the Wi-Fi over three months ago, and even after sending a request for personnel from the mainland to repair this issue, we've received nothing. We sent letters back home to reassure our families, but even with a snail mail in this day and age, it's odd we haven't gotten a response back. Every day I refreshed my email. Nothing. Our irritation turned into boredom, which turned into worry and speculation. One summer came in October and the ice shelf had melted. A dozen or so of us decided to embark for Argentina via a research vessel previously frozen solid into the ice. The Geraldine Palmer, or the G. Palm as some of us like to call it. It was both a resupply mission, but also just to figure out what exactly was going on with the lack of contact from the outside world, hopefully, and bring back some fiber optic specialists while we're at it. The voyage would take two days and be relatively uneventful, some leopard seals and Adelaide penguins, and the usual. On the second day, the Wi-Fi abruptly resumed. My MacBook has suddenly exploded with emails. Strangely enough, the latest was dated three months ago. Most of it was pretty mundane. A birthday email from my fiancé who says that he misses me. A bank statement. Some spam. I hope that the emails would give me some clue as to the great mystery of the informational blackout, but nothing. That is until I noticed an email from my postdoc mentor at Berkeley, Dr. Greg Kleinhardt. Hey Lisa, hope you're adjusting to life in Antarctica, and I hope all goes well with the lichen research. A colleague of mine, Dr. Jar Damati, a pathologist at the Samarinda Medical Institute forwarded this email. I thought it might pique your research considering your dissertation work with cordyceps. March 28th, 2025. Indonesia Cordycep. Dr. Kleinhardt. And given your mycology expertise, I thought you could bring your two cents to this intriguing incident at a small remote village on the island of Borneo. Apparently, there were rumors circulating from the village of Badukesu in central Kalamatan about a fungal disease spotted in orangutan cadavers, which the authorities had begun to call Penyakit Assam, meaning tamarind sickness. Dead orangutans brought to the village were shown to have large orange tendrils resembling tamarinds, hence the name. I was contacted by the Indonesian government to investigate this possible new fungal infection. When I arrived at Badukesu, deep in the Bornean jungle, I had my guide, Abang, who was able to translate for me between Indonesian and the tribal language, Dayak. I inquired the elders to let us see the orangutans, and the young men led us to an empty field on the outskirts of the village. We could smell it before we saw it an entire field filled with rotting orangutans. A thick cloud of flies cloaked the field, and I had to cover my mouth as the stench was utterly putrid. Two men with rags covering their faces took long sticks and poked at the corpses. We could see the appendage-like orange fungi protruding from the animals, and I have included some photos attachments for you to view. The gross were about three feet in length, half a foot in diameter. A few of the men stabbed and had popped the tendrils, releasing a rain of what appeared to be spores ten feet in the air. 
We asked the men where they had found the orangutans, and they pointed down a small jungle path. We continued it down the path and we stopped. We asked them where it could be. A bang looked confused. What did they say? Look up. When we looked up and my jaw dropped, above us in the treetops were the bodies of hundreds of orangutans with the same orange growths protruding off their fur. The men would use long bamboo poles to knock them loose, as most of them appeared to have chopped down on the trees with their jaws before a rigor mortis had set in. We took some samples back to Samarinda and performed a culture test, which confirmed this pathology was indeed a fungus. Analysis of its nuclear ribosomal genes determined that the fungus was a normal form of cordyceps, perhaps the first one that's known to infect mammals, which is surprising, considering the fact that we previously thought the mammalian immune system would be too complex for cordyceps to infect, unlike these simpler immune systems of an insect. However, this novel strand seems abundantly more evolved to suppress the immune system of a mammal than any cordyceps known to us. We are still in the preliminary phases of research, but we found some surprising findings concerning the fungus behind Penyakit Assam. When we dissected the orangutans, we found that the fungus had densely infected muscle cells, replacing up to around 40% of the muscle mass of the orangutan. We also found that it had extensively attacked motor neurons and caused lesions in the premotor cortex. We suspect that what caused the orangutans to chomp down with their jaws on the trees in the final stage of the infection was due to a final massive release of neurotoxins we found to be quite similar to those released during a tetanus infection. This death before the fruiting bodies of the cordyceps burst out of the dead orangutan we would love for you to review the data that I've sent to you and to extend a cordial invitation to Indonesia, where we hope your expertise would be invaluable in this ongoing investigation. Best, Jair. That was the email. Anyways, I'm currently headed to Jakarta next week. I'll keep you updated. Let me know what you think about this situation. Hope you're staying safe and warm. Warmly yours, Dr. Kleinhardt. There is another email dated a few days after. Dear Lisa, I'm getting ready to head back from Indonesia, but what I've witnessed in the past week has been, for lack of a better word, distressing. I arrived in Jakarta a week after the email and then proceeded to travel to Samarinda. By then, Dr. Damati told me about an emerging epidemic in the village that had started the week before I had arrived. The villagers told us that over a dozen villagers began experiencing fevers and chills. It started with the men that actually showed us the field of orangutans. At first, the patient would feel lethargic, and then there would be nausea, vomiting, muscle convulsions, and delirium. Patients would need to be physically confined to bed due to the rigor of the muscle spasms, which the villagers ominously called Penyakit Assam. Noticeably, one individual had recently gone missing, a bang, the interpreter for Dr. Damati. A bang was reported to be one of the first villagers to fall ill with the disease. After suffering several muscle spasms, his family confined him to his bed. The next morning, the bed was empty, and the rope reportedly appeared to be gnawed off by the teeth. The week following, villagers reported smelling a stench that resembled rotting carcasses, but were not able to discover the source of the odor. It wasn't until enough flies gathered that the sound of insects buzzing led to a horrifying discovery. It was the body of a bang, who had scaled the palm tree. There was blood where his hands and feet had violently clawed into the wood, and his jaw, like the orangutans, was firmly clenched into the bark. His expression was one of intense agony as of mid-scream, and protruding out of his eye sockets were the same orange acylcarbs that were present on the orangutans. Limb-sized tendrils were protruding out of his back and head. Dr. Damati and I made plans to travel to Badukesu, but a few miles outside of the village there was a military roadblock on the only road into the village. 
Dr. Damati argued with the checkpoint guard, but after offering a bribe, we were able to make it into the village. As a precaution, we were dressed in hazmat suits. They were utterly unbearable in the jungle humidity, but considering what had happened to Dr. Damati afterward, I was grateful that I wore them. As we approached the village, we could see plumes of smoke. When we had arrived, we found the village completely abandoned. We then made the horrific discovery that the plumes of smoke came from a massive funerary pyre in the center of the village. The smoldering remains of the village people and the animals of it were piled unceremoniously on the dirt road across from what appeared to be the village mosque. I was nauseous to say the least, but Dr. Damati appeared more confused than disgusted. The village was Muslim, he muttered. Cremation is forbidden in Islam. The villagers would not do this unless... Unless what? Unless there was something that forced them to. Then we looked up. Dr. Damati instinctively began to recite a doa in Arabic as my mouth fell open. Oh my god. Above us, a dozen vultures and other birds circling the palm trees surrounding the village. It was then that we saw it. Whole families, young and old, had climbed the 32 feet high or so palm trees. All of them had clawed into the trees like a bang, and similar orange fungi protruded from their eye sockets. And just like a bang, long orange tendrils sprouted from their back and heads. I fell to my knees. You know me, Lisa, I am not a religious man, but at that moment I prayed. I didn't know to whom, and I didn't know what I was saying, but I prayed. Jair, I said, we need to get out of here now. Silence. Jair. I turned around. Dr. Damati had his back turned to me, and he was shaking. Jair, what's going on? Dr. Damati turned around and I could see through the clear plastic head covering, a look of sheer panic on his face. He held up his arm, a flap of plastic hanging from a massive tear in his suit. Jair, we need to get back and put you in quarantine now. And Damati looked pale. I, I'm going to end up like them. No, you're not. Have some sense. We don't know if it's airborne. That was a lie, I know, but I didn't know what else to tell a doomed man. At that moment, we heard a series of popping coming from the trees, and a flock of birds flew from the palms. The Asco carps had ruptured on some of the corpses hanging from the trees, and a putrid, smelling cloud of orange began to diffuse into the air. The birds, having flown into the cloud, began to fall from the sky. Damati bolted for the road and I quickly followed. We got to the checkpoint when Damati began to lose his breath. He staggered forward before falling faced forward. The soldiers aimed their rifles and were barking at us in Indonesian. Dr. Damati, are you okay? He vomited before putting a hand up to brush me away. Please, he wheezed between chokes. Leave me be and go tell the others. At this point, Dr. Damati began to seize and, in a frenzy, began to rip off the hazmat and then his clothing. The soldiers scurried back, terrified, and pointed their weapons at Damati. I remembered that they were shouting, Penyakit Assam! Penyakit Assam! Dr. Damati continued to seize for ten seconds, his back thrashing back and forth and his eyes rolling back, drool pulling out of his mouth. The soldiers shouted and then fired a shot. Crack, right in the leg. He abruptly stopped and laid still. Dr. Damati. I turned him around to see if he was responsive. His face contorted in pain, but he did not respond. And then I noticed a tiny change take place where the bullet had struck. It didn't bleed. Right where the bullet had entered his body emerged a yellow dot that grew bigger. I stepped back in repulsion. In rapid motion, the dot grew into fingers that protruded like a snake, growing until there was nearly a foot out of his gunshot wound. 
His torso began to move and expand like a balloon, until the tearing of skin revealed those monstrous tendrils of orange sprouting forth from my colleague's body. The soldiers held me until a medevac helicopter could arrive at the field nearby. I sat there, the soldiers a good 30 feet away, staring at the body of Jair Damani. He was 43. When I got back to my hotel in Jakarta, I knew what I had to do. First, I had to make a difficult phone call to the family of Jair Damani. And since I didn't speak Indonesian, I don't think they really understood me. Next, I had to warn people. This thing evolved so quickly, Lisa. And the speed at which it proliferates is like something from a B-movie horror film. I urgently gave them the account that I just gave you. And then sent the CDC some pictures of the orangutans with the fungi. As well as the data that Dr. Damani had sent me previously. I waited in that hotel room anxiously, staring out into the busy traffic street below. Mopeds and bikes went by, all these people, oblivious to the fact that just 90 miles away in the jungle lay something of unspeakable horror. My phone rang and I picked it up. It was Dr. Mike Haynes from Your Thesis Defense, who now heads the Mycotics Disease Branch of the CDC. Mike, you need to get your folks on this ASAP. Whoa, whoa, Greg. Cordyceps that infect what? Mammals? Humans? You know how improbable that sounds. Yes, Mike, but I'm telling you. I saw it. My friend. Dr. Jahir Dema. Greg, we're talking about a massive phylum-sized jump of a fungus from insects to mammals. I looked at the pictures, Greg. I think you're jumping to conclusions there. Those could be a variety of other suspects. You had to jump to cordyceps. Mike, did you look at the nuclear ribosomal data from Damati? I don't need to, Mike. This, this is science fiction. The mammalian physiology. It just wouldn't support a fungal infection to the extent you're claiming. Did you drink the water there or something, Greg? I tell this to my colleagues and I'll become a, a laughing stock. We talked for a few more minutes as I desperately tried to get him to take me seriously, but I failed. He hung up and I tried to call every reputable mycologist, animal physiologist, and entomologist that I knew. They all responded with similar levels of incredulity. I prayed like I never did before in my entire life that that thing did not come out of the jungle. Given what happened to Badu Keshu, an entire village, in the span of a week... It chills me to my core to think what would happen to a city like Samarinda, or even Jakarta. Indonesia is the fourth largest country in the world, population-wise. This is a ticking time bomb, and we need to get it contained. Or the consequences will be catastrophic and hellish. I'll set up a meeting with the Ministry of Health tomorrow. Warmly, Greg. Another email a day after. Elisa, the meeting was a disaster. The Director General of the Indonesian equivalent of the CDC, Dr. I.D. McMurr, practically laughed in my face, accusing me of being a victim of old wives' tales from the jungle backwaters. Nobody's listening. I hope that at least you can believe me, Lisa, even when I can barely believe myself. I am leaving Jakarta for Oakland tomorrow, but I haven't slept for days. I am simply exhausted. Greg. At this point, my MacBook had died. I grunted in frustration, pulled out my iPhone, and proceeded to check if the signal had come back on my phone as well. It did. I proceeded to check my email from there. The next email came a week later. It was a blank email with the subject in all caps. Goodbye. It has started. Just in the middle of downloading, I heard the long blast of the ship's horn. The ship had arrived in Argentina. I remember when I first passed through the city of Yushaha. It's a decently populated port town at the tip of the Tierra del Fuego in Argentina. It's a jumble of colorful houses and shipping containers surrounded by these massive snow-capped mountains. 
On a typical day, it's crowded with ships and tourists as it's the primary hub for Antarctic tourism, as the continent is only 48 hours away by boat. However, as we pulled into the Beagle Channel, which normally bustles with boat traffic, we noticed something was wrong. No boats, not a single one. In fact, as we pulled into the port, not a single boat remained at the pier. I stood at the deck of the G Palm along with everybody else, five including the captain. Carlos Rivera, an astronomy postdoc from Princeton University, was the first to say it. Where is everybody? Even as we began to disembark, we could sense the eerie quiet of the entire town. No cars, no people, not even a stray dog. We began to disembark slowly with unease. Aguen esta aquí. Rivera cupped his hands and yelled. Aguen. His voice echoes through these still streets. With no response, we decided to walk around the town. We passed an empty park with a sign with the town's motto. Yushua, fin del mundo, principal de todo. End of the world, beginning of everything. However, Yushua and Principio de Toto had been crossed out hurriedly and spray painted. We began to walk uphill towards the mountains, and we began to notice things. Like how some cars were parked haphazardly in the middle of the road, with their doors open like it was abandoned in a hurry. Doors were broken or unlocked. There was a crashed ambulance that hit a fire hydrant, which apparently had since stopped flowing. Grocery stores were near empty with shelves tipped over like dominoes. There was a police barricade with abandoned police cars that looked like they were trying to keep something out. What was more surprising, though, was the clothes that were scattered everywhere. Winter jackets, pants, shirts, dress, all thrown on the ground as if the townsfolk all decided to rapidly undress. And did the rapture happen or something? muttered someone in the group. Nobody responded. We then came across a white building with words hurriedly painted in faded red spray paint. It looked recent, yet faded and crusting from the exposure. Yo, Rivera, what does this say? Rivera came by and squinted. The handwriting was messy and almost indecipherable as if written in a rush, or a panic. Circa, oh Dios de ti. Closer, God to you. Like, nearer. God to thee. Like the Titanic. Someone in the group muttered after a pause. The group fell silent. After an easy few seconds, Diego quickly added, ah, Come on, guys, it's only graffiti. It doesn't have to mean something bad. His voice trailed off. I brushed my hand against the graffiti and noticed how the letters began to flake off of my hand. A familiar, coppery smell. What's wrong, Lisa? My hands were shaking, and not just from the cold. I heard a metallic clank and realized that I had stepped on something. A blood crusted knife, still moist. I think it's blood. I then looked down the street and my breath stopped cold. We looked around, and it was everywhere. Circa, oh Dios de ti. Painted across almost every house in the block in blood. Then beyond the barricade, there was a white wooden church. Its steeple collapsed, evidently from fire damage. That wasn't what caught our eye, however. In big bold letters in the same crimson hue as the graffiti, was a big arrow pointing up into the side along with the scribbled letters in English. God is nowhere. God is nowhere, someone read. Where did he go then? Scoffed Rivera, who was known to be open the atheist. No, no, it, it doesn't say that, I realized. I pointed to the space between the W and the H. I think it says, God is now here. The arrows pointed to the mountain peak. There, barely visible to us, appeared to be something, scattered on the snow of the mountain. I took out my camera and began to zoom in on the summit. 
There seemed to be thousands of tiny dots of various colors, brown, pinkish, all gathered around the top. I squinted and zoomed in, and then I realized. The details were blurry, but I could make out human shapes with large, orange masses protruding from all over their bodies. They're people. Guys, I think I know where everybody went. I faltered, trying to think about how to break the news. The barricades are to keep something out, guys. It was meant to keep something in. You're going to want to hear this. I pulled out the emails on the phone and began to read out loud everything that Dr. Kleinhardt had told me. The last email from Dr. Kleinhardt had already finished downloading, so I read that out loud as well. Subject. Goodbye. It has started. Stay. Lisa, I'm typing this as I stand atop the Transamerica Pyramid in San Francisco. It's begun. The spread. Jakarta fell the week after I left, and then Kuala Lumpur, and then Hong Kong, and then Chennai. In three days, it had reached London and Doha. Despite travel restrictions, we heard reports that it had arrived in Mexico City yesterday. Have you seen the news reports, Lisa? The videos of the bodies of those construction workers from Hong Kong, on top of that skyscraper site, and the bodies that crowd the minarets in Cairo. The photos of the Champ de Mars deserted, except for the Eiffel Tower completely filled with the fruiting corpses of the infected climbers. Everywhere panic, followed by chaos and followed by silence. Entire cities and their inhabitants have turned to dust. This is the balance of nature, Lisa. The same reason why almost every no insect has their own distinct species of parasitic cordyceps. When a population gets too big or too destructive, nature has its way of thinning the herd. We plundered and polluted land and sea for greed. We destroyed millions of acres of wetland, reefs, and rainforests. By doing so, we are meeting with things that were always meant to be apart from humans. We're not masters of the earth. We are guests living on borrowed time. We disrupted an equilibrium we saw. And with every action comes an equally devastating reaction. Is it any wonder that these pandemics keep appearing every other decade until eventually nature decides that we're no longer worth keeping around? I tried Lisa to warn them, but they just did not want to listen. Billions of men, women, and children are gone because I failed Lisa. I'm sorry. I'm so, so sorry. Do you remember when I helped you edit your dissertation, Lisa? How we discussed how humans and Mycelium have a common ancestor. How our genomes are nearly the same. The beauty of fungi is that they can connect in a way that human minds never could. This is goodbye, Lisa. I can feel it inside. I'm going home. The email ended there. There were 10, maybe 15 minutes of silence. The wind howled and the waves crashed in the distance. After a while, the questions came. So it's a fungus, uh, like a mushroom? Yes. But it infects people and what? Kills them? If it works like Cordyceps militaris, the species that infects ants, I think it works like this, but I'm not sure. The fungus takes over the central nervous system and forces the victim to have convulsions. It grows in the body until the victim is more mycelium than human. Eventually, I think the fungus hijacks the motor neurons and compels the victims to go somewhere high up. That's why they climb trees, towers, mountains. People, driven by the neurotoxins flooding their systems, begin to strip their clothes off so that the fungus has a better chance of distributing spores than the ascocarps, the fruiting bodies, I faltered, feeling nauseous, mature out of the host's body. Based on Dr. Kleinhardt and Greg's reports, this strain of cordyceps is especially airborne and contagious, and the cordyceps has a reproduction cycle, unlike any fungi that we've ever seen. So it's all over the world then, it seems like. Carlos dismally said. Yeah, that's why we haven't been getting any singles from the outside. No resupply shifts, no nothing. 
This is it, guys. We need to find all the supplies we can get. Uh, I don't think there's going to be another place to restock. And we decided to split two ways. Carlos and the captain would go back to the harbor to prepare the ship. The rest of us three would go to the pier and find the necessary supplies to bring back to the research station. As we began to haul bags of rice and medicine back to the pier, I heard a strange hissing sound, like a whistle in the wind. And then it got louder. I turned around and it was coming from the mountains. From the peak, there was a haze, almost imperceptible at first. But we could see it coming rapidly as it began to cover the sky. Within 20 seconds, the sky had turned a sickly orange color. I shuddered when I realized what it was. I dropped what I was carrying. We need to leave now. When we left the port, we realized truly how alone we were. A small vessel in the vast and turbulent ocean of the unknown. Yet when we looked back, there it still is, the orange sky, advancing mile by mile closer towards us.